but also admiration. Here's a couple of uh, talented Wyoming climbers who are no longer with us. Um, Todd Skinner, originally from Pinedale, um, completed the world's first free ascent of a grade seven climb. And Bobby Modell, National Geographic photographer and climber. And um, this will look familiar to <laughs> a couple of folks. Um, highlight, home to a couple of other Bozeman climbers you may have heard of, but I'll defer to um, the next speaker to talk more about that. My point is that these mountains breed passion. Um, I just got a couple photos of some of the ranges that are in the GYA. So again, this is Granite Peak, the highest point in Montana. Whoops, that one is it. This is Black Canyon Lake, um, Spirit and Forget-Me-Not Mountains. Mystic Lake in front of the Mystic Equinox Tower and a lake on East Rosebud Trail. Uh, Grand Teton from the Teton Crest Trail. The Wind River Range. The Shoshone National Forest. So that's home. Well, what's at risk from climate change? You've all talked about, all the speakers preceding me have talked about what's being impacted by climate change in their neighborhoods. You're all familiar with the plight of the pica. Alpine uh, vegetation such as this gentian are, are similarly affected. This is a, a fire in 2008. I think there's many variables contributing to the escalating fire seasons, but certainly climate change is one of them. In 88, this was unique. Now it's routine. Uh, this is a glacier below rear guard. We're losing our glaciers, which of course is the source of so much of our fresh water. This is, um, did I go too far? This is a, a series, a time-lapse series of photos that um, is being done by, what's well, a comp composite courtesy of Edward Chatelaine, I think is how it's pronounced, shows the loss of the glaciers, this particular glacier in the Beartooth Mountains between 1951 and 2002. So here's 1953, 76, 80, 88, 94 is a pretty dramatic difference, and then today. Um, I will point out they made, that our archaeologists made a remarkable discovery last summer, a coiled basket melting out of an ice patch in the Beartooth Mountains. So you all may know that ice patches dif differ from glaciers in that they're static, they don't move, they don't grind things up. And prehistoric bas basketry of any kind is quite rare on the Northwest Plains and its island mountain ranges but shows up in a small string of rock shelters running up through the Bighorn Basin into Montana and at Pictograph Cave. It occurs as early as 4,500 years BP and seems to disappear from the archeological record at 1,200 years BP. And this was found on top of Beartooth Plateau. Um, my archeologists are using the analogy, the refrigerator door is open, the contents are spoiling. So there's a brief window of opportunity to recover artifacts. And um, I put a little, a little bit longer article on the back table if you want to see a little bit more about that. The same thing's going on um, in the Tetons. So there's uh, some an old picture of uh, rangers on the Teton Glacier. Here's a schematic of the loss of Teton Glaciers, and that's just one of many that have been mapped in the Tetons. Um, we have high-altitude species in decline. Um, this is whitebark pine, a grizzly bear food source. In light of all that, what opportunities do we have? Um, the Brundtland Commission of 1987 developed this definition of sustainable development. Development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And in 2005, the World Summit on Social Development developed this um, schematic that you've all seen um, that's also known as the triple bottom line. Um, I kind of like the additional descriptors at the um, intersections that says that in addition to social, environmental, and economic, those are the three pillars. You need, it needs to be bearable, it needs to be equitable, and it needs to be viable. So back to the description of the regional efforts in the GYA. On the federal side, um, the Greater Yellowstone Coordinating Committee, or GYCC, 
um, was formed in 1964, so 50 years old, um, and consists of both Yellowstone and Teton National Park, six national forests, um, the Elk Refuge in Jackson Hole, Red, Wa Red Rocks National Wildlife Refuge, and more recently, um, the BLM has joined the GYCC. So I showed you the, um, this, this is the GYCC map here. So you can, you can see the six national forests that surround it and then the BLM lands. Um, since they have been around 50 years, they've developed several subcommittees to address various resource issues in common, such as invasive species, fire management, fisheries, air quality, climate change, and sustainable operations. And I, I guess I want to say sustainable operations in this case is not the same thing as sustainable land management, which is focused on the ecosystem, but sustainable operations is addressing our own footprint, you know, our offices, our fleet. What, what, what uh, effects do our operations have on, on the landscape? And in climate change, we talk about both mitigation and adaptation. Um, mitigation is on the prevention side. Adaptation is how do, we, how do we adjust to what's already happening? How do we manage species in light of what's already happening? And sustainable operations is on the mitigation side or the prevention side. So this GYCC subcommittee on sustainable operations, here's their, um, their vision. Um, actually, the focus area, somebody pointed out everybody has six or seven of them. So ours are water conservation, um, waste stream reduction. You know, it's a lot better if you don't even generate the waste in the first place. Uh, energy conservation, um, that whole bit about um, education, not just our employees, but our visitors. There's lots of opportunity there. Um, making smart choices on purchasing in the first place. And fleet and transportation management. And we feel like as stewards of this very special place, our objective is to cultivate a behavioral shift amongst our permittees, concessionaires, employees, and visitors that will promote a heightened awareness of our connectivity to and responsibility for the environment. And we're hoping to emerge as leaders in this ecosystem-wide sustainability effort. Okay, then we turn over to the business side. So here's a, um, the Yellowstone Business Partnership unites businesses dedicated to preserving a healthy environment and, and um, shaping a prosperous and sustainable future for communities in the region. So they promote a scientific understanding. They promote informed dialogue and a collaborative approach to resolving the region's most complex socioeconomic and natural resource challenges. And is actually modeled after the Sierra Business Council in California. You can see their map is here on the right and has something in common with ours. This is a, um, a summary of some of their focus areas. Uh, they have this program called um, a sustainable framework that is based on LEED certification. You've all heard about that from the US Green Building Council that has ratings in the platinum, the gold, and silver. But it's bringing it down to the regional level, specific to GYA issues and resources. And then the second one is um, encouraging responsible business practices. That's that Uncommon Sense program, and I'll talk more about that. And the third one is a regional transportation cooperative, where they had a vision of providing a visitor a car-free vacation for, or for, for workers and uh, residents who need to get around in the GYA. Um, so they were trying to connect already existing um, transportation providers. That particular vision proved to be a little tricky, and I'll come back to that one. So back to the Uncommon Sense program. This was a two-year leadership program for businesses and organizations seeking to operate more efficiently and responsibly. There are 28,000 businesses in the GYA. Think of the potential. So their um, modules um, pretty cl closely mirrored our, um, our focus areas. Same thing with, with uh, waste stream management and responsible purchasing and all that kind of stuff. They did emphasize a business response to climate change. We had a separate subcommittee on that. Um, one of the things I mentioned was that accountability. So they had scorecards for each module. You spent six months on each of the modules. Well. In a six-month period, you would focus on two of the modules, and you had, to, you had to accomplish things on this scorecard. You got to select the scope and the scale, but you still, had to, you still had to complete them. So it was viewed, in some respects, as a regional certification. 
I thought, in my, from my perspective, the most beneficial aspect of participating in this program was just sitting with peers, with fellow um, sustainable operations champions and brainstorming solutions, not feeling like we had to reinvent the wheel, discovering that there was a support network out there. And I always found it to be really inspirational and I always left those sessions really fired up. Um, some of the partners that we had in the Uncom Uncommon Sense Partnership um, included people who have permits on the Beartooth District, including Red Lodge Mountain Ski Resort, our ski area, the Bridger Bowl Ski Area is on the Gallatin, um, and the Stillwater Mining Company um, that produces platinum and palladium and is the second largest employer in the state of Montana. And all of, you know, like the Stillwater Mine has 1,600 employees. I'm not sure the number on the two ski resorts, but they employ and influence a lot more um, people um, than I do really out of my office. So there's a lot of leverage to be had there. And interestingly, I mean, some fellow classmates included education, um, both Montana State, Teton Science School, and many others, several architectural firms. Um, the, whole, the city of Bozeman participated, Knowles did, um, a medical center, a newspaper, a bank, um, several restaurants and travel companies, and now they're expanding to um, what's known as the crown of the continent, up around Glacier Park, Big Mountain, Whitefish area. So back to this idea, um, well, the three pillars of sustainability. What's the Forest Service's role? Is it the environmental circle? Or do we also have a role in the social um, sphere and, as far, and the economic well-being of the communities of the GYA? I guess I'm arguing that we have a role in all three. So my rationale, um, I, said, I said up here, why, do we, why did we join? We is the Beartooth Ranger District. So mine is the only district in the whole Forest Service system to partner with businesses on sustainability using this particular model so far. I'm hoping to expand that. Um, we have a solid sustainability foundation based on that, our participation in GYCC or the Federal Sustainable Ops Subcommittee, but I wanted to support YBP's emphasis on that triple bottom line. And I want to support those businesses that support the environmental side of the equation. I feel it goes both ways. Um, also, <laughs> the Uncommon Sense program forced a higher degree of accountability, believe it or not. It's well aligned with our own objectives. I feel our na agency needs to walk the talk as land managers, but also for consistency with our permittees in the Uncommon Sense program, like Red Lodge Mountain and Stillwater Mine. Finally, this is a quote from Paul Hawken, who's um, a pretty well-known environmental entrepreneur and a widely published author. I'll let you read it yourselves. <laughs> um, but I think he makes a valid point. I think government has limitations. Is getting more limited, actually. So um, there's common goals for and barriers to sustainable operations for both gov government and business. Um, the common drivers um, reduce overhead costs to free up more money to do mission work. I like the idea of having more work to hire seasonal or more money to hire seasonal. As taxpayers, we all have an interest in reducing our operating costs. We have a common interest in maintaining natural resources. Um, common challenges, um, employee capacity, it takes time, and frankly, if you're relying on your same champions year after year after year, it's not built into their, their job description, and you face a little bit of burnout um, if, unless, you, uh, unless you see results and let them expand and grow their wings and restructure things now and then. It can take money, um, and also within every organization, I think you'll face skepticism. One challenge that I think is unique on the federal side is the incentive to reduce our overhead costs is much more indirect. Any money we save on um, energy expenditures, for example, goes back to the general treasury, and I don't get to see it back in Red Lodge, so the incentive isn't quite there, but we're working on that. We are looking for opportunities to leverage our own practices with those of our neighboring participants, including our own permittees, so we can influence vendors and bring in biofuel, et cetera. And I'll show a couple of examples of that. Um, I think that before we did this Uncommon Sense program, we did have the history of working individually. So here were some of the accomplishments of the Sustainable Operations Subcommittee. 
Um, one of the notable ones was to com complete a GYA-wide greenhouse gas emissions inventory of all the units. This was the first ecosystem-wide inventory, and it caught the attention of um, the White House. The leader for that got a White House award. And then we did a subsequent action plan, which I um, have um, open in the back if you'd like to see that. We've used some Georgia Tech interns to conduct a GYA assessment of energy conservation opportunities in our historic buildings. Um, the Forest Service has been around for over 100 years, and some of our backcountry ranger stations are getting a little dated. <laughs> They're a little rustic, frankly. And so um, the historic preservation offices um, are interested in weighing in. When we modify a building to make it energy efficient, they want to make it st stillish. Make sure it still has its in uh, historic integrity. But we also have the opportunity at some of those backcountry stations to explore micro-hydro opportunities. And water conservation, um, we've partnered with Kohler, who d donated 37 water-conserving fixtures, resulting in um, reduction of water consumption by an estimated 450,000 gallons a year. So that's good for the moose or for the swans. Um, in Annis, the ranger station there um, put up these solar panels, and what was interesting about this is um, when they tracked their savings in energy, um, the, the energy reduction was way more than you could account for by just the installation of solar panels. So what they attribute that to is that just the, the presence of those solar panels in the yard that people had to walk by every day or bicycle by or however they got to work. Um, it reminded them that, that this was a, a district that's interested in energy conservation, and so they did other energy conservation practices that reduced the bill overall. Um, this is just a, um, a photo of uh, removing 12.8 miles of fence in the Pryor Mountains, where we removed 3,300 steel posts, 153 rolls of barbed wire, um, which amounted to 14 and a half tons of steel, which we gathered and recycled in Billings. Um, this is another um, facility that's um, in the Tetons, the Lawrence S. Rockefeller Preserve. So this visitor center was the first LEED certified property in Wyoming and only the 52nd platinum rating in the whole system. It features composting toilets, extensive use of natural daylighting, and a 10 kilowatt photovoltaic system, among other features. Um, so it earned all 17 lead energy points that were possible, and it was dedicated in 2008. So those are some independent efforts, but what I wanted to, to I think the whole point of the Uncommon Sense program is to get us to start thinking bigger, uh, work together to influence change. So Red Lodge Mountain was, as I mentioned, was another participant in this um, leadership program, and they reduced the number of vendors making deliveries up the mountain. So it's six miles from Red Lodge up a dirt road to get to the um, ski area. And so they reduced the number of vendors and worked with local restaurants to bring resp responsible products to town. So it's um, Bridge Creek Restaurant was one of those partners that worked with them and also started to use compostable takeout containers. But it's just that idea of working even in a small community like Red Lodge, if you can work together to influence what comes to town, you're starting to make a difference. This is a, a glass pulverizer that's um, been working in, in Yellowstone Park. And they, they, they did it for obvious reasons. Rather than shipping glass hundreds of miles to a landfill outside the GYA, then Let's grind it up, and they used it in two gradations. One is um, it's kind of a, you can use in construction material in place of sand um, or gravel. And then the other is you could, you could sand the roads with it when it becomes icy. Um, but I think it's a great opportunity um, for, for a business to figure out, um, you know, here's this source of material. Rather than going and digging a brand new gravel pit somewhere, let's just, um, start to use this in, in either construction projects or uh, some other kind of manufacturing. So here's a picture of the Stillwater Mine for those that you have, of you that haven't been there. It operates both the Stillwater and the East Boulder Mines in the Beartooth Mountains of Montana. Both mines are located on what's called the JM Reef, one of the world's richest known deposits of platinum group metals or PGMs and the only, signif only known significant source of PGMs in the U.S. or outside of Russia and South Africa. 
So it's a significant resource. And as I already said, it has 1,650 employees. It's also at the mouth of Stillwater Canyon and a major portal to the Absorca Beartooth Wilderness, as you can see from the photo. Um, they're a partner in Uncommon Sense, and uh, I'd like to, <laughs> like to be able to focus on some of their sustainable operations that could be expanded to other businesses and agencies. So um, on the left, there's a picture of a, what they call a two-yard mucker that uses biodiesel and is also equipped to reduce emissions. Stillwater's air quality emissions have been reduced by upwards of 70% in the past 10 years. Um, and they use approximately 900,000 gallons of biodiesel annually, making it the largest user in Montana and one of the largest in the Northwest. And then the third picture is a, a biodiesel bus in Yellowstone Park. So vendors are already bringing it here. Um, shouldn't we, uh, as other businesses and agencies, be looking at how to use the biodiesel? And of note is why does SMC use the, is, use the biodiesel? It's twofold. Um, they are operating under a good neighbor agreement, which is a very formal um, agreement that was actually overseen by a judge um, between the mine and, uh, and some small environmental groups um, in the region, the Stillwater Protective Association. But it's also good for the bottom line. Um, they save money. So for our sustainable operations skeptics in each of our businesses or agencies, um, sell it from the cost-saving perspective. Whether the focus is on conservation of energy or water or fuel or paper, not all green choices cost money. So this is, um, again, Stillwater Mine and their operations with respect to water. Stillwater recycles all the water necessary to support underground operations. This amounts to roughly a million gallons of water per day. They have that partnership. So. Um, Let's see, this, this group up here is the Stillwater Protective Association helping them um, do the biological and water quali quality sampling since it is on the Stillwater River. And then Stillwater Mine uses, um, used to direct all the septic waters to a drain field. Now all septic up to 15,000 gallons per day are biologically treated for nutrients, sent through a UV disinfection system, and finally to a land application where the waters are beneficially reused. Um, the site is then leased to local ranchers for cattle grazing. Wildlife, again, with, under the Good Neighbor Agreement, workers are bused from many Montana communities. I don't know if they go all the way to Bozeman, but I'm pretty sure they go to um, Big Timber and maybe farther. Um, it's meant to minimize traffic on the road for human safety, but it's also good for the wildlife. So um, the bighorn sheep, <laughs> actually really like it at the mine. Um, they like hanging out on the, the rehab. Um, the herd has recently reached the highest number on record. Um, it's over 60 animals, which doesn't sound like a big number, but it's up dramatically from the low 20s about 20 years ago. And then um, there's elk that winter there. Um, Stillwater does allow elk hunting on the property for first year hunters, disabled hunters, and active military personnel. Moving on to another partnership, this is uh, the Lamar Buffalo Ranch. Um, and so both Yellowstone Park and the Yellowstone Institute partnered up to make this happen. Uh, here's um, both, at, well, okay, so, so Yellowstone Park went dumpster diving um, to figure out what the contents of their waste stream was. And they figured out a large percentage of the waste was those um, Coleman gas, propane gas canisters. and. Uh, so they worked with, um, at first, um, well, I won't go there. Coleman, Coleman wasn't in initially a partner, um, but uh, Yellowstone Park worked, worked with the Billings business um, to develop this thing on the um, upper right. Whoops, went too far. Uh, that thing. And it, it actually is partially um, powered by the um, propane that comes out of the little canisters, and then they can crush them once they uh, get all the gas out of the canisters, then they can be recycled. And so that's been a, um, a, a huge success since 08. Over 35,000 propane cylinders have been collected and recycled throughout the greater Yellowstone. And then last year, MSU students helped um, the Sustainable Operations Subcommittee develop this bear spray canister recycling unit because a lot of visitors to Yellowstone come on a plane 
and they're not allowed to take that bear spray back on the plane on the way home with them. So this is, um, we have a lot of collection points and then recycle the bear spray canisters. On a much smaller scale, um, in my office, the Beartooth um, District installed this bottle filling station. It's modeled after the ones you see in Yellowstone Park. Um, to, to get people to think about um, not bringing in all the plastic or the bottled water. And we, uh, we, we provide coupons that a local business honors to give people a discount um, if they um, come in and get a Nalgene or some other kind of refillable water bottle. And I don't think you can really tell, but there's a picture of a moose shaking, it, shaking the water off of his ears above the water filling station um, to bring the message home. And some other low-hanging fruit in the office environment, whether it's government or business, is just we've made our copiers and our printers all default to double-sided double printing. And things like changing the light bulbs, or better yet, leave the lights off and use just daylight. Um, the one drawback there is we've had people um, drive by because they thought we weren't open. We didn't have all the lights on. Um, and then, of course, another focus area is the public education aspect. So we've made all kinds of posters for visitors and sharing the news with the public and describe, first of all, the need um, to be conscious about uh, sustainable operations. And then, secondly, how can they help? Um, this is the Beartooth District's green team. It did take um, a lot of effort to get through eight, modu eight modules over two years. Um, working with YVP and our fellow classmates. So I have here representatives from our fleet um, management, a hydrologist, a purchasing agent, fire. Um, if any of you have been in, <laughs> probably haven't, but if you've ever been in a fire camp, um, they've turned into um, pretty, old and pretty industrial <laughs> organizations and there's definitely room for improvement, um, including uh, uh, reducing the use of bottled water. But this was a, a, a definitely a team effort um, to get to this point. Um, I want to move a little bit beyond what we've done on the Beartooth and the GYA. Um, I think it's great, all the examples we saw today, and I just wanted to include a couple of random efforts that I've seen elsewhere. Um, last summer I had the chance to work in um, the Cascades, and uh, it was really interesting that they hired um, um, Leavenworth Climbing Ranger. And this was just um, one Saturday out. This was all the recovered webbing uh, that he got off of um, Prussic Peak in the, well, that's Prussic Peak in the background. So he got this webbing um, in the Alpine Lakes Wilderness, which is a heavily used wilderness out of uh, Seattle. Um, some of you will know it as the home of Fred Becky. And then here in Colorado, in our backyard, um, this is the 10th Mountain Huts, and I, th I think they've always been um, pretty good models for sustainable operations, and you can note the sol solar panels here on uh, Betty Bear Hut. And then just as we've traveled, all of us have traveled and um, seen mountain cultures um, worldwide. Um, I made the statement to one of you this morning. <laughs> I thought, you know, I'm not an anthropologist, but to me it's like compared to the way we live in the U.S., indigenous cultures seem inherently sustainable. But somebody pointed out to me that the use of the reliance on um, firewood for fuel isn't necessarily sustainable. So. So I'm, I'm staying corrected, but definitely the effects of tourism um, are having an impact on those mountain cultures. But I've been pretty thrilled to see um, in the Kumbu, this was a um, micro hydro project and they just demonstrates their reliance on local power versus the grid by necessity. But also um, I liked this uh, little water filling station. So they did offer, um, you know, they offered the bottled water, but they created a different incentive. So it was 80 rupees for bottled water or 50 rupees to use the bottle filling station, which was treated by solar powered ozone treatment and accompanied by this educational sign, which I thought was just excellent. <laughs> so anyway, um, the journey continues. Obviously we're never done, um, but it's really rewarding and refreshing and just inspirational. I could go on and on interacting with businesses outside the usual forest service sphere and to see how much they can accomplish. I've just been so impressed with that. And just having Peter Metcalf do the talk this morning, um, you know, I'm trying to tag on to that message of his that was so inspirational. 
And so I would highly encourage folks to look into joining similar organizations in your area. Um, unfortunately, I would say, I have to acknowledge that YVP is reorganizing. Um, with respect to that transportation co-op, they let their vision outstrip their capacity. And so they've evol they're evolving into something called Sustainable Yellowstone and others. But um, Montana DEQ has stepped in to continue to help fund that Uncommon Sense program, so that still exists um, for businesses that, you know, there's still, still a tremendous amount of business interested in working together to, to promote this type of um, sustainable operation. Um, finally, lead from where you're at. Um, these successes are not generally due to a government or a business mandate, but rather a result of grassroots efforts and sustainable operations champions within your organizations. So do what you can to enable your champions, um, encourage and facilitate partnerships, um, inspire, create incentives, um, tie it to local issues that people care about. Build momentum until you get a critical mass and be the spark. And then back to this idea of encouraging some of you to come work with me. Um, as much as I'm honored to be here today and talking about this kind of stuff with all of you, I'm also honored to have been tasked with managing a really special piece of ground with the most dedicated group of federal, fellow federal employees. Um, and as you all are aware, um, whether here or probably in different countries as well, management of national forests and parks and refuges is in a critical period now. So th for those of you interested in your heritage of public lands, get engaged in whatever fashion. And that's my conclusion. We got questions for Travis. Sure. Uh, given the, uh, what we all would like to do with, in terms of re reducing and reusing and recycling, uh, I'm wondering if you know if the bear canisters are recycled or is there any, I mean, it seems like 99% of those would never have been, dis would never be discharged. And I'm wondering if those are reused and, and handed out somehow or are they recycled? Well, I know in the park, um, it comes back to that mention of litigation this morning. So unless they can kind of track where they've been, they do not put them out for reuse. Um, but I think there are efforts elsewhere where they're, um, they do that. It's just the government doesn't do that. Um, and then, so I think the ones that we're doing, they get punctured and the canisters get recycled. Yeah, but I think that, yeah, so, so we can't really, yeah, I, I mean, enough said. <laughs> I agree, I agree. I have a question. You talked initially about accountability. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have a way of publicly either acknowledging or otherwise showcasing people who are, who have fallen down on, on the job? I mean, how do you make accountability not just a personal or private problem, but also something that may have some community of uh, engagement? So um, the accountability piece uh, came into play with this, this particular program, the Uncommon Sense program, is we were asked to make a presentation of how we met all those criteria. Um, so each module had some specific, pretty specific criteria, whether it was, you know, and it ha you had to have it measurable reductions in, in either waste management or, um, water consumption, et cetera. And then we had to get up at the graduation, which was public and had media in attendance, and say what our accomplishments were. So I think, but as far as um, ongoing monitoring of how we're doing, we're trying to build on that and use um, alumni from the program to, to continue to bolster that, because it's really easy um, to walk away from it, frankly. I don't know if that answers your question. It does answer. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? All right, well, I want to thank Trouda again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.